course, the bronze gun that we just passed right here is a Confederate 12-pound Napoleon gun capable of firing three sorts of ammunition for long range. And of course, that's what we're looking at out here. Now the 10 roads leading in or out of the town, you will also have the Hanover Road. You've got tour stop number two, the Peace Light, and the area of the Lutheran Theological Seminary. You're going to have guns posted in all those areas. And those long, weird guns up by the Peace Light, the Whitworth guns, capable of firing five miles, way beyond the ability of folks to see. Those are going to be guns that are going to be utilized in this as well. But Confederate technology is not one of those things that is kept up with things at this point because uh, there have been two fires, and we can appreciate the warmth of fire at this particular point, but two <laughs> fires have left the Confederate artillery somewhat crippled because uh, they need to be able to manufacture shells and fuses reliably, and when the fire is done, the two fires, one in March and one in May of 1863, they're not going to be able to get those fuses and shells to fit quite well together. And if you're an infantry guy and the shells are whistling above you, you don't need to worry if it's going to burst behind you, above you, or way ahead of you like it's supposed to. And so many of the batteries that are online on the northern end, northern hills line, and in Ewell's line, will actually be given the order to fire with plugs. So that means the job of a shell is normally to burst into lots of pieces, good hunky pieces about like this taking out folks on the other side and making themselves very effective. But instead of that, Lee will, for safety reasons, tell his artillerist not to function that way, basically just to pop into giant 12 or 10, uh, 10 pound bolts that will be fairly harmless. The other thing that's going to weaken the Confederate assault artillery-wise is this is going to be a very long line, very parallel to the Federal line along Cemetery Ridge. And that means that the flight time of each one of those shells as it goes across the attenuated line of Cemetery Ridge is going to be very short. The Confederates do not have the time to take their artillery and move it north so that when they fire their cannons, their flight time above the Federal line is a longer flight time, which means we don't care if it burst here or burst down there, it still kills Yankee. So precision is a matter of some concern here. And that's one of the things that E.P. Alexander points out. But this is one of the things that will come uh, a little bit later, that the Federals are in a very good position, very lone position here, and the Confederates having pulled their guns down along this line. This is not a bombardment that is well situated for that. But in Lee's report, uh, he notes the batteries were directed to be pushed forward. They will start off with this long-range bombardment at 1 o'clock. As a matter of fact, at 1.07, the bombardment will actually get underway with two signal shots that are supposed to go off at the same time, but they go off 1 o'clock and then 1.07. Now, one of the questions folks always have is just how long that bombardment goes or, or how many guns there are involved. Some folks will say that 138 that I mentioned earlier. Some folks will do counts and say nearly 170 guns will be involved. And that's the number that I actually come up with. <coughs> now, let us do something that we need to do. Let us take a quick look at some of the different sorts of guns, and then we're going to be feed a little bit back into the shade. the rifle guns, the black guns, and most all the black guns around here are rifle guns. A little bit more precise, a little bit more accurate at distance. They're very good for doing that sort of thing, but they throw smaller projectiles. And so that section, those last two guns form a section. And the bronze guns are a little bigger, a little less accurate because the ball actually bounces on its way out. Yeah. So 
target on the far side. So this is a representation. This is actually our, uh, the marker for uh, Pitch Crew Wolf Hoax Battalion uh, as it's moved up here on the third day. Just a little bit of shifting as they uh, go from the second day positions to the uh, third day positions. But Alexander's guns are down in the area of the Peach Orchard. That's the most southerly extension southeast as the line curves down in that direction. It comes back up to this area, to the Point of Woods, as it's called, and then it extends back in that direction. And if you look over the trees, you'll see the stadium lights. Okay? And back up in that direction towards the, around the north of town, past the Peace Light, back over towards the Hanover Road. And of course, when you back beyond in that direction, you will come to Cemetery Hill. And of course, the Federals have about 30 guns on Cemetery Hill. And Cemetery Hill is going to be a useful position for the Federals because as the Confederate infantry go along Cemetery Ridge here, will be in a good position to come out. Their guns mounted there would be a threat to our Confederates. So we will have uh, guns that will be trained on that. But also, you remember, with guns posted along the Hanover Road, there will be Confederate guns on the backside of Cemetery Hill, and they will be able to make use of that position as well. And one of the uh, report, reported impressions of that point comes from the fellow uh, commanding the 11th Corps. And let me get to his particular record uh, at this point, because when that bombardment starts, We'll have a little bit of observation about the intensity of that. Um, <coughs> I learned a lesson about laminating cards a while back. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. Uh, he will talk about the effect of the Confederate guns over on the Balt on the uh, Hanover Road. He said, several guns, two batteries or more, opened on us from the ridge beyond East Cemetery Hill. So they're firing this way. And he said, the gunners got our range at almost the first shot, and they caught us square in the flank and with elevation perfect. It was admirable shooting. They raked the whole line of batteries, killed and wounded the men and horses, and blew up the caissons rapidly. So at the initial portion of the bombardment, Confederates seemed to be doing well coming from that direction, uh, firing this way. He said, I saw one shell go through six horses standing broadside. The problem for the Confederates at that point is they don't have enough guns on that far position to really begin to do things at that time. Same thing with what's going on down along the line here. Remember, this is, after all, Plan B, and prepping and preparing for an intense bombardment of some distance is not what they really had in mind because General Lee's plan here was to do this for about uh, 15 minutes maximum before they actually begin the advance of the infantry. But one of the things that cranks this up is our good old Yankee friend, Winfield Scott Hancock. Because Winfield Scott Hancock, when the 2nd Corps is under bombardment at this point, he's going to jump up and begin to throw shells back. Now, you think it's easier to hit something that you see or something that you do not see? No. Yeah, and one of the things about the gunpowder in this era is it always blows a big white smoke, and when you see that big white smoke, then you can start aiming at it, and so that's what the gunners will begin to do. They will begin to return fire with more precision, and so they will begin uh, to go at it. So Doctrine at that point in time said you do not waste ammunition in a cannonade gun to gun at this point. If you suspect that the enemy, the Confederates at this point, are beginning to get ready to throw masses of infantry at you, you wait until they actually bring that infantry out into the field, and that's what you save the ammunition for. And see, this is where there's going to be a great debate for years and years between General Hunt, the Federal Artillery Commander, on the Federal side, and Winfield Scott Hancock. The debate will continue even after Hancock dies, when the uh, Colonel, uh, as, a, as the Chief of Staff of the 2nd Corps, will begin to take that position up as well. <coughs> However, one other
other thing is very critical out here. The Confederates, what are the Confederates basically for? I don't want to hear slavery, that's political. I want to hear tactical. States' rights. States' rights. The right of smaller things to do as they please. Okay? Now, I've already mentioned uh, Henry Jackson Hunt. Henry Jackson Hunt is a consolidationist. He likes to have things work under one hammer with all of the smaller elements, all of the smaller cores of his brigade working under one commander. So if the Confederates want to do things in a smaller sort of way, then they will have every brigade, every division, every corps working individually. So now we've got these three corps, Longstreet, Hill, and Ewell, that have worked fairly well in small ways. But now we have this massive organization where all of these guys are going to have to want to work together. And the commander of all of that is tasked with trying to put that together. And so he's not doing so well with this. David Greg McIntosh, who is a battalion commander in the artillery, will write later about what's going on with this. Because these guys are not communicating well with each other. They're not used to doing that. The success of the scheme, talking about the bombardment, depended in the first place upon the ability of the Confederate batteries to overcome the fire of the opponent and carry confusion into the ranks of the infantry. such cannonade had been experienced before by either army, and the impression of the very serious effect produced on the enemy's line proved a delusion, because what's going on on the federal side at this point, with all these shells going in the air, what are they doing over there? Lying down. Are they standing up, waiting, looking around? Hunkering down. Hunkering down, waiting down. And McIntosh says this, the soldier who has been taught by experience to hug tight to his breastwork knows that it is more dangerous to run than to lie still, comes to regard with stoical indifference the bursting missile missiles which are mostly above or behind him. And it is definitely a terrific bombardment at this stage, because when the Confederates are all committed, the Second Corps is all committed at this point, this is a noise that will be heard in Baltimore, Maryland. Because of the weather and the thermal inversion that's going on over here, this noise bounces over the mountains in western Pennsylvania and is actually heard in Pittsburgh. This is the loudest noise on the North American continent until they catch the atom bomb in the desert. But for some reason, there was quite a delay until all became settled. Now, when it does finally get settled, and there is a little bit of a debate as to just how long this thing runs, you read many of the federal accounts, and they say this goes on for two hours. <coughs> However, the accounts of many of the federal uh, say this goes on for a little less than that. And E.P. Alexander, the reserve artillery uh, commander under James Longstreet, says that there's no way this could have gone on for two hours because they simply did not have the ammunition to make it that long. We'll say that this does go uh, for that length of time. But towards the end of this, the effect of draining all of that ammunition while they're sitting still means that the shells left in the limber boxes and the caissons of the field artillery here is all now flying in the dirt back along the federal line. So how much support do you think these batteries are going to be able to offer the Confederate infantry as they begin to uh, rise up and begin to move forward? Zero. <laughs> That's right, zero. Again, going to Joseph Graham, he says, Consequently, we had to advance very slowly, exposed all the time to the enemy's fire. We could not do much. The lines moved right through my battery. I heard men say, this is worse than Malvern Hill. A year and a day. I don't think that position can be carried, etc., etc. Etha Honton of the 8th Virginia will witness a very interesting thing. How many of you uh, have purchased a Civil War print? You like those Civil War prints, those Kunstler prints, and all the rest of those guys? Here's, the, here's a moment you'll never see in a Civil War print. Just as the order 
to advance was given at the end of the bombardment. Major Deering, who was picket artillery guy, passed with his caissons to the rear at full speed because the reserve artillery, all the wagons with all the extra shells, is a mile to the rear on the Chambersburg Pike. <coughs> So when the bombardment begins to phase out close to 3 o'clock, there is a intense discussion between Pickett and Longstreet. You know, what are we going to do now? What are we going to do? And this trickles down. As Deering and Hunton pass, Deering says, for God's sake, because the infantrymen are beginning to move now. He says, for God's oh. sake, wait till I get some ammunition and I will drive every Yankee from those heights. So imagine at that point, the reaction, you know, you picture the sad sack Confederate musket and right shoulder shift beginning to go up the slope. The, the field is full of silvery gray gun smoke unbeknownst to them, the Confederates, or the Federals rather, you think their chests are empty at this point? As far as the cannonade goes, General Hunt has made sure that there are number one reserve batteries and number two, 20 extra rounds per gun against the regulations that he was told he could do. He snuck 20 extra rounds per gun for every single one of those 365 guns in the federal line. He will tell General Meade about that later. <laughs> but the artillery has not quite set the stage the way that we had hoped that it might.